Hi. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. We'll get started in a, just another minute or two. We're just waiting for a couple more people to pop on who registered. How's everyone doing? Staying warm? Drying. <laughs> it's gotta be warmer in Shreveport though, right? It has to be. Yeah, yeah, it's a little warmer. We had a little freezing rain yesterday. Oh, the dogs. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, I don't know if the ice got to Memphis. I don't know, Elise, where, where, she, where are you at? She's in Murray. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm in Murray and um, we are off school today with ice. So, yeah. <laughs> Lovely ice. Like yes. it shut down the airport in Dallas. Yes. I actually um, routinely ride my bike to campus and, you know, and if it's pouring rain, I won't do it. But if it's cold, I just bundle up and I, I didn't know that the ice was coming in. So I rode my bike home. I, I kind of tested the road, oh, the sidewalk, no. and I did go on the sidewalk, not the road, and because there were no students on campus. I kind of felt it. I went really slowly to make oh. sure, and I got home, and then my spouse rides an electric scooter to work, and I called him and said, you are not riding the scooter home. I will come pick you up. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, we're, um, we have a a really interesting webinar for you today, which I'm really thankful that our wonderful executive director, Nicole Collier is going to be presenting. Um, before she gets started, I just wanna um, say that this, this is being recorded and it will be shared um, on our YouTube and our website. We do have, uh, we've been doing webinars like this for about a year. Some of you have been uh, participating in some of the other ones. And so just to let you know that we do have those recordings available if you weren't able to attend the recording or if you know of someone who would like to watch this one as well. Um, so Nicole will, you know, will share that link with you all. And um, Nicole has been our wonderful executive director of NAC since 2019. I think you came on right before our conference. Um, and uh, so she's done an amazing job of, of um, doing a lot of the behind the scenes work for accreditation. And she's presenting today. Um, if you don't know, she's an alum of Texas A&M's master's program. And I'm actually using her capstone project because she did a research study on Louisiana. So um, she also does amazing research with um, the Center of Philanthropy, Texas A&M. So she holds many hats there and she um, keeps us all very organized with NAC. So um, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Nicole. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to, you know, there's a small group you can ask us verbally or in the chat or ask Nicole. So um, <laughs> that would be great. So thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, thank you all for being here. I know it's a smaller group, but this is a lot of what my initial meetings for accreditation are about. So I feel like it's really useful for us to have a webinar on this. So it's here for future reference as well. So this webinar is basically about preparing for NAC accreditation. Um, if you are considering it and wondering what will the process look like, what documents should I be collecting, how should I organize them, and what should we expect at each phase of the process. So that's what I'm here to help you with. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or ask. Um, the only thing I would have to say is that, like Heather mentioned, I came in about two months before our London conference. So I wasn't around for a lot of the design of the actual process. So if you have more questions about why we decided to design things a certain way, uh, ask those towards the end and uh, I can direct you to Stuart, answer the best I can, or maybe Heather can help as well, since she was there for a lot of the design and implementation of this. 
And this is going to be a fairly uh, detailed process because I want to make sure I answer all your questions. So if someone's considering accreditation or even just starting their program and wants to think of a way to collect their documents and syllabi, this is an option for you. So some of the basics. Um, we do offer accreditation on a rolling basis. When we first started, we had set timelines for each phase of the process, but we've changed it. Some schools find it really useful to be able to pay the fee and then collect documents throughout a semester or a year and actually go through the process in the summer when students are around. Uh, everyone has different semesters as well. So uh, we found it more useful to allow schools to do it on their time and just have us there to help at any point. Right now we have accreditation only for standalone degrees and majors at NAC member programs. So you do need to be a member of NAC currently to get accreditation. And right now we don't offer accreditation or certification for certificate programs, minors, tracks, anything like that. It might be something we consider in the future, but right now it needs to be a master of nonprofit management or a bachelor of arts in nonprofit management. Accreditation is valid for six years. And then most importantly is myself, Stuart, accreditation staff and NAC board members are here to answer questions at any point before, during, even after the accreditation process. You'll never bug me, there's no question too small because I'm a person that fixates on details as well. <laughs> so a quick overview of the accreditation process. Uh, I'll have this up throughout just so you can see what phase of the process we're in. I break it into four groups for the purpose of collecting documents and what you should be expecting. So section one is just the initial application and paying the fee and then having a meeting with Stuart or myself to plan out the process, figure out your timeline, uh, what would be easiest for you. Section two is an overview of your curriculum and program and collecting all your documents. Section three is an interview about your program and what makes it unique and mapping out your curriculum in more detail. And then the final section is having external reviewers look at your program, creating our actual document and report, receiving your feedback and distributing that for you. So before you'll ever start accreditation, I will give you this handy dandy accreditation checklist that I created. And it has hyperlinks to each of the parts of the application and kind of outlines what to expect next. And it even outlines the parts that you don't have an active hand in. So if you are wondering, oh, it's been a couple of weeks and I'm not sure what's next, it'll say on here what's happening throughout the process and when you'll be called back in. And this will be made available to you at any point throughout the process. And I put it in your shared document that I'll get into later. So section one, the first part of the application is very basic information about who's participating in the accreditation process, what degree or program we are accrediting, and how to submit payment. Right now, accreditation is offered for only $2,400 for one program. If you are someone that has two programs, uh, you might have two master's programs, you might have a, a graduate and undergraduate program, we do have a discounted fee for getting both accredited. You'll only pay $4,000 instead of $4,800. You can pay via credit card or check. Um, a little bit of we, uh, in the weeds detail is if you need an official invoice, sometimes that takes a little longer, but we can create that. It'll just say a and at the top since a and is the fiscal host of the Nonprofit Academic Centers Council right now. So the first application also talks about the process of accreditation and has some outlines by Stuart and the accreditation committee. It talks about how you'll be completing the program and a little bit of what to review or what to expect. And then you will basically just include information about who you are, who the decision-making body is in your program, the name of the program, and any links you want us to have for a general overview of the process. So for example, a and right now at the Bush School does not qualify for accreditation, but pretending it does, I would include the basic link for the nonprofit management degree if we offered one, so nonprofit.tamu.edu. And I would put my information since I would be facilitating the process, but I would also include our center director and program director, Will Brown, since he is the decision-making body and I would want his name on all documents. Next, we I will meet with you, talk about the process with you and create a shared 
beautiful Dropbox folder. And this is where you'll put in all your information and documents. And these are also outlined on the checklist. Once these documents are collected, we schedule an interview over Zoom. And this gets into what makes your program unique. And that's something I really try to emphasize throughout the accreditation process is that we're not trying to just make sure you check off boxes that we've set ahead. We wanna know what makes your program unique and what you are excited about with it. So I have a little sample Dropbox that I have created. And this is what yours will look like. It has notes about what we expect to collect in this folder and a basic outline, excuse me. So before our interview, we'll need you to put in any resumes and CVs for professors, teachers, et cetera, that have been part of your program over the past two years, syllabi for classes that have been offered in the past two years. Here's the accreditation checklist I referenced earlier. That'll be accessible to you throughout the progress and it's editable so you can mark where you are. A little document talking about how accreditation was formed and why and how each process was molded. And then we have a basic curriculum matrix, which I'll show you a bit of in a second. This will be how you map out the basics of your program in a slightly informal way. And then we have your application questions. And this will be covered in the next part of the interview. Now, previously we would ask each of these questions in the interview and take notes but we found it to be more valuable to get at the uniqueness of each of our programs. If we have you fill in some of the more basic information, the quantitative information beforehand, and just have that as notes, that way we can spend most of our dedicated interview time learning more of the details of your program, what makes it unique, more of the narrative things. So we ask that you complete the, some note, basic notes on these questions and send it to us ahead of time. So we can use it for your report without wasting any of your valuable time on it. Hey, Nicole, can I ask a quick question? Of course. Um, so as far as the CVs um, and resumes are concerned, is it core faculty or are you looking for the, um, like our, if we hire subject matter experts to adjunct and? Subject matter experts and adjunct professors as well. Anyone that teaches any classes that are dedicated to that program. Okay. Uh, some people find it valuable to make separate folders within the, doc box, the Dropbox of core faculty and adjunct faculty or by people that teach electives, like if they're housed within a different department. But we do ask anyone that teaches classes that are a core part of your program to be included. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, so I mentioned the quick program mapping document. This is a picture of what it looks like filled out as an example, and this example will be included in your Dropbox folder as well. So we ask you to list the courses that are required for your program as well as electives. And you just put the title, the course, code and number, basic information, and then what guidelines, singular, plural, that are fulfilled by this program. Uh, this helps us get a general idea of your program, but we do a more complex collection method later. But this example is here for you so that it's not too complicated to fill out this Excel form. There is a folder in this Dropbox marked additional mapping documents. These are not required, but a lot of uh, programs like to bring in documents about uh, extracurricular activities they offer, uh, programs that they want to be reflected in their report and also so we can know the flow of classes the students are required to take. So for example, once again, this is AM's example. Uh, I have this document that talks about the classes students take each semester and like how and electives that are offered as well. So these are not required, but they do add some me and uh, other information to the to our report so we can get even more detailed. And then, like I briefly mentioned, we ask you to fill out questions about your program ahead of time and you can have them as notes during the interview. We don't want uh, the interview to be you struggling to find information or just reading 
or reading stuff you've written before. So we want this to be a more open conversation about what you enjoy about your program, where you're hoping your program will go and what makes it unique. We want to, however, be able to include some of the information you have to look for in the report. So that's why some of the questions are about the typical student to teacher ratio in your smallest classes and then your biggest classes. So we can have that information to talk about it without wasting time during the interview. So that is section two of the application process. Once that interview is completed, oh, something I forgot to mention about section two, once we collect the documents, we ask that you give us about a week of time before we schedule the actual interview. That gives Stuart and myself time to look through the documents so we can think of relevant questions for your program and learn more about it. So once that interview is completed, we send you the link to your more detailed program mapping. This is a more detailed version of the Excel sheet I showed you earlier, and in some ways, it's almost the inverse of it. So for the first document, you list classes and say what guidelines it meets, if it's required or not. But instead of this, this application will take you through each specific guideline. So uh, like guideline one, and we ask you how extensively you covered each guideline, what classes you utilize it, et cetera. And I'll take you through each part of that. So for this example, I used an undergraduate guideline. And so for each guideline, it'll say the name of the guideline and each sub guideline. And first it'll ask, how is this covered as part of your program? Is it part of your mission and core learning objectives? And you'll say if it's not at all, a core objective in individual classes, uh, not at all, only covered in extracurricular programs or projects, or in individual assignments. So that's the first bullet. Part of, is it part of your mission and core learning objectives? And if yes, if yes, describe how it's part of your program's mission and core learning objectives. And we want this to be a more narrative explanation. How is it described in your mission statement? And how is it associated with each of your classes that it's brought up in? For the same, and then for the same guideline, we ask if it's covered in individual classes or objectives, assignments, extra curricular activities, you list those. So this is where the sharing, the Dropbox folder comes into play. So if it's an individual learning objective, or course in a specific class. We wanna make sure that the name of the class that you put in this field is the same name that's put in the Dropbox because this is what the external reviewers will look at to look at how well you cover each of our guidelines or how extensively, more accurately. And then finally, within the topic of each guideline, are there any specific learning objectives, class objectives, assignments, that you think are particularly distinctive and noteworthy. If you are exceptionally proud of your volunteer management at your program, this is where you can highlight that. And this is what we can really highlight in your report. So you'll do that for each of the guidelines, either undergraduate or graduate. And then once you've done that, your bulk of the work is done. That's the good news. The bad, bad news is now you just have to wait a little bit. Because once we've collected that, we have external reviewers that come in and they look at the previous documents you've collected and especially this last program mapping document. And they look at how and map it against each of our curricular guidelines. And they see if, yes, this is covered as part of this program I'm reviewing, no, it's not. Or yes, this is an exceptional uh, guideline that is covered within this program extensively. And then once we collect both of those reviews, we use this along with your interview information to create your report. And once this report is created, we send it to you and we wanna hear your feedback. As part of this report, we'll show the basics of what each reviewer said, not necessarily the notes, but if they said yes or no for each guideline. And this is your chance to reach back out to us and say, oh, I should have highlighted this, for guideline seven and I didn't, is there any way I could appeal this? And Stuart will look into that and address it accordingly. Okay. 
So we ask you to do that within about a month, but we know your schedules are busy. So at any point for any of this, we can do this on your time. So if you're like, sorry, you're asking me for these reviews in April and finals are May 1st, and I just don't have time right now, you let us know and we can adjust that timeline. I even have it sometimes where I send uh, set a reminder every two weeks to just send you an email and you're welcome to ignore it and not respond. Or you can just have that as a brief reminder to do it for five minutes to work on this for five minutes a day. Once you send us that review back, we will have copies professionally printed along with a PDF version, send it to you. Um, and we can also mail those copies to deans, university presidents, whatever along with the official certificate and a MAC accredited logo for you to use on your website or materials. And here's like the top of the certificate of accreditation. One thing I'd like to highlight that we've changed because I know there's a few of you that have already been accredited. Originally on the certificate, it would say words like uh, meets 10 out of the 16 curricular guidelines set by NAC. We don't want to give, while we know that this is just a guideline, it's just a note to some outside people, it looks like we're giving you a C minus, <laughs> but this is not a grading thing at all. So we have changed some of that language to say meets 10 guidelines with exceptional competencies in eight of them, or whatever you show exceptional highlights on through those course objectives, extracurricular activities, mission statements, etc. And then that's really it. Uh, does anyone have any questions for me? Does anyone need any further clarification? Hi, Sal. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. Thank, thank, thanks for this opportunity, by the way. So I've got one question which could segue into a two-part question. We'll start with the first. Um, I was taking notes along the way and I'm glad it's gonna be recorded so I can refer back to it. Yes. I appreciate that. But I heard you say a couple of times over the past two years. So is accreditation only offered for programs that have been running for two years? That's a great question because there are some new programs that reach out and want to go through accreditation when they're in their first semester. <laughs> uh, so what we currently ask is that if there are completed syllabi for all of those courses, we will accept that. But uh, Right now, we've only accredited schools that have at least had one graduating class, but it is not a requirement as of yet. And that's something that Stuart can help you elaborate on more as well. Yeah, so um, yeah, yeah that, that's very helpful. One graduated <laughs> class. Now, the second part of the question would mm -hmm. be, um, what advice do you have beyond the obvious if it's a new program mm -hmm. and we kind of do a turn the tables where we want accreditation to kind of guide mm -hmm. to some degree the development of the program because mm -hmm. we we want to be accredited and we want to yeah. come out of the gate fulfilling mm -hmm. the accreditation guidelines yeah that's a that's a great question and something that Stuart has uh really shown a lot of uh great ideas on so he has worked with a couple programs. We originally didn't want it to seem like, wow, in our reports, wow, you're really lacking in this area <laughs> because we're not trying to do that to our programs. But if schools want to use this more as like, what areas can we grow in? Stuart's really good at formatting the reports to say, and here's some potential areas for growth that you show exceptional competencies in. So that can help you with like leadership decisions with your dean and saying, see this accreditation report shows the importance of this guideline and that we have a lot of room to grow in it. So normally we tell Stuart that as part of the interview and he incorporates it really well. Okay. So theoretically, mm -hmm. if I had a brand new program coming out of the gate, I could refer to the guidelines and mm -hmm. of course the curricula guidelines to kind of yeah. marshal this through. And then once I have the one graduating class under my belt, I can then make the application official and pay the fee and get it started. Yeah, I think, okay. yeah, you could even start the process when you know you want the application to be done, like when the first students graduate. So you can work on it over the second year or final semester for those students. Got it. Yeah. Elise, do you have a question? Thank you. Yeah, um, sort of a follow up to that. Um, and we've, you and I have had this meeting, but mm -hmm. since then, um, and this is wonderful news, but we have been approved to, our program is changing pretty dramatically. Um, mm -hmm. In 
close, in fact, closer to NAC guidelines. There were a lot more, um, it's more streamlined now, basically. Okay. So will that be, we aren't introducing new classes. So all of the classes we were already offering, okay. but I was planning on the timeline you and I have talked about is over mm -hmm. the summer. So right. that new program, that new catalog won't be until the fall. Okay. That's, should I wait or I will, we, our, our program is old. We have lots of graduating classes. Yeah. And again, the courses aren't new, but the catalog is changing. Yeah, that's a great question. And it might be worth talking to Stuart about, but I think this can definitely be covered as part of the interview. So if you have any, okay. like, for example, new faculty that you're bringing on, that's like really going to guide y'all towards, I don't know, a specific competency. Sure. We can have that highlighted in the report and say, y'all okay. have already shown, like, you've developed this, like, foundation of coursework, and we really see that you're going to, like, move it in this direction. Okay. Yeah. I think since the courses are remaining the same, it won't make any difference to leadership that might see the certificate and see, like, 12 guidelines met exactly right. so but it can have some like good meat in the report that will show that we recognize your areas of growth and are looking forward to like however you change sounds good thanks <laughs> yeah, of course does anyone else have any questions i know i went through a lot of stuff really quickly um and that's fine but i just want to make sure the main thing that I highlight is that we're available to you at any point throughout this process, even if it's uh, some idea you have off in the future. I'm happy to help. I'm even happy to create a shared Dropbox for you. So if you're like starting a new program and it's just helpful to you to create, to start organizing your syllabi and stuff like that, that's something we can definitely do for you. And I would, um, I want to add as a reviewer of this process, like you should be as detailed as possible. Mm -hmm in your mapping yes um, so you won't have to go back and make that argument and i think like you know it's so it's clear to both reviewers yeah. um it's so there isn't any mm -hmm. yeah. yeah exactly while we want this process to be burden free for our members yeah. we can only give back to you what you put into it <laughs> and i would also add to the new program thing um like i use the NAC guidelines when creating our new bachelor's degree and with the assumption that we would go up for accreditation in a couple of years. So I I mean you're 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 good at curricular mapping anyway, Sal. I learned it from <laughs> yeah. you. So you know I think that <laughs> you should be fine. <laughs> but, that's that's yeah. very helpful advice though. I'm I'm taking notes again and it's good to hear this. Yeah, I, I mean, I created the learning objectives all based on the NAC guideline, the undergrad NAC mm -hmm. guidelines. And yeah. so I would know that making sure that the program and the courses were aligned to the guidelines so we could easily, hopefully, mm -hmm. go through accreditation. So. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One thing I can show y'all real quick is within this shared Dropbox folder. Um, I did make an option for you to organize based on the guidelines if you want. Some schools are like, I really don't have time and they just want to put all their syllabi in there, which is fine as long as it's named clearly. But I have also made little folders where you can map your classes by what guidelines you reference them in in that mapping document. That way, if the reviewer is looking at stuff and is like on guideline two, they can click in there and see these are the syllabi for courses where they say they meet guideline two. Um, ignore the thing that says net quality in there. The way I can make mass folders in Dropbox is by having something in them. So our nice little logos in there. But yeah, there's several ways that you can try to organize this that make it easier for you to map out and easier for our reviewers to get to the details of what makes your program meet each of these guidelines. So this might be a little bit in the weeds, but um, our new m, &M <clears throat> excuse me, is being, has been pulled out, well, we expanded our graduate certificate and we have kind of pulled it out of our um, nonprofit concentration in the MPA. Right. <clears throat> One of the, so Doug Erke was our external reviewer when we established the mm -hmm. program. And one of the things that he said was, please make sure that you are intentional in how you're presenting these classes. So it doesn't just look like a rebranded MPA. Mm -hmm. um, has that been, um, a big issue when going up for accreditation and how uh, how does a program like that 
present itself. So it's not just like, no, really, we just slapped M&M on it and <laughs> called it good. <laughs> yeah, um, that might be more of a Stuart question. I'm not sure if we've had, just because I may not know the history, programs that started as MPAs that switched. I mean, I'm sure many of them have, but not that have switched while I was here. Heather, do you have the Yeah, I mean, I think that at least from my experience with the, again, Stuart might know more, but the ones that I've reviewed and seen that are accredited, they are they are separate um, yeah. and they are unique in their nonprofit mm -hmm. courses. So um, I, I haven't seen really that many that have been the, the public administration centric. Um, so they- Yeah. And that's really, that probably doesn't help, <laughs> but- um, yeah. I would say it's almost like Stuart's specialty though in uh, he's a big believer in the phrase nonprofit and philanthropic education first. So he's pretty good at showing where programs have strived to make nonprofit and philanthropic education the forefront of the class, not just tacked onto the name of it. Right. And I think so basically what we did was pull the nonprofit concentration out and make that the mm -hmm. core. So really it is nonprofit first. Yeah. I think it's more just an issue of, okay, so um, like our methods class, we will share with the PA side and it's, you know, it could be a nonprofit faculty member. It could be a PA side faculty member right. teaching it. So like, you know, when, when it comes to some of those classes where there is some overlap, is that going to be a big yeah. deal? So that, that is common. Like, and okay. I mean, where Sal is yeah. at and where I'm, where I was at, like there was overlap, probably three courses in the degree. I mean, I might be wrong. Um, of, of other ones, but like in my most recent and, in um, in my last institution, it was overlap of three. So, mm -hmm. okay. So that's common, mm -hmm. but so I guess I did. Yeah. No, I think I it's relatively common. And as long as it's clear in the syllabi of the course and the syllabus of the course, it shouldn't be an issue. Any other questions for me? Excellent. I'm going to assume that means I answered any possible questions you could have had slash you're going to email me or call me up at any point because I'm always happy to talk with y'all. So then really quickly, um, I just want to say thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a bit of an in the weeds conversation, but as I say, that's kind of where I thrive. So I'm happy to help y'all out at any point. Uh, this These slides and the recording will be put on NAC's website soon. Just go on the main NAC website, hover over events. Webinars will be the first one. And you can also view our past webinars on there. For example, Stuart's presentation on accreditation and more about uh, the decision-making process behind it and benefits. Webinars on student recruitment and more are on there. And mark your calendars. Our next webinar is March 31st with the great provocative tile title, do universities and colleges have any future in nonprofit education and training? Yeah, I want to highlight that this one is going to be really interesting. Yeah. John has um, done some, some preliminary research on the uh, third party professional development providers and online providers of that are in this space with us. And so it's very, I think it's gonna be really interesting. So. Yeah. And there's a great panel that's gonna be on it that we'll announce probably in the next week or so once the last one is finalized. So we hope y'all can join us then. You can register for that one on the exact same link as where all the past webinars are. But thank you all so much. You're welcome to stick around and ask questions or just chat, but Otherwise, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Heather. Good to see you both. Appreciate it.